Oh boy, yeah, man. This episode of SmackDown was absolutely awesome, man. It was shockingly good. I'm sitting here floored because as many Raws and SmackDowns as I've watched over the last few months, you know what I'm saying? I review each one and they've mostly been absolute and utter trash. Tonight, absolutely cooked, okay, this was a quote-unquote generational run episode, as, as, you know, the kids are calling it, right, this was good, okay, I'm not gonna lie, something unexpected and shocking happened in more ways than one, the ending of this episode was phenomenal, uh, the actual, me uh, the middle of this show when Cody did his promo with KO, I genuinely am surprised to say this, y'all, but Cody Rhodes was amazing in this segment, in this promo, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but, we, but man, th th let's just start it off, man, this was absolutely absurd, CM Punk in the bloodline like dude what was this what was this man they don't need to do this every week but can we at least be half of as good as tonight was going forward now don't get it twisted there were some things tonight that were absolutely blood boilingly blood blood boilingly stupid and garbage specifically with the women's division but we're going to talk about that in a little bit we started off the episode with solo sokoa who cuts one of the worst promos of his life right <laughs> now obviously we have to all come back down to earth right this wasn't the greatest episode of smackdown ever and it wasn't a masterpiece by any means now let's get back down to earth so Solo Sokoa comes out at the beginning of the show and basically says, you know, the usual stuff. Roman Reigns, your bloodline isn't ready. My bloodline's better. I'm better than you. We're going to beat you. So I demand you to come out later tonight and acknowledge me. He says it all the time, right? Roman wants Roman Reigns to acknowledge him. And uh, basically he says that, you know, if you don't surrender by the end of tonight, we're going to destroy you for, and we're going to absolutely leave you, you know, dead for good or something like that. It was a pretty bad promo, especially considering the fact that I think Solo over the last few months, over the last month specifically, last month or two, who has been getting better like on the mic to see this downgrade tonight that was honestly just a very mid slash bad promo I was genuinely a little bit taken aback by it and it was kind of disappointing um after this we got Bianca versus Chelsea Green versus Blair Davenport this match I genuinely expected it to be one of the worst matches of the year however it actually ended up being decent all right this is a decent match and I have to say something that's absolutely true at this point Chelsea Green is over okay she's over with the crowd um at this point I'm not a big Chelsea Green fan. You guys know I think her, Tiffany Stratton, and, uh, you know, what was the other one I said? Uh, Liv Morgan. I think they're all jobbers, right? Because at the end of the day, even if you're in a higher spot booking on the card, it doesn't really matter to me. Talent-wise, they're all jobbers. But one thing I do respect about Chelsea Green is that she actually is trying to put herself over on social media, you know, with her backstage segments, a little video segment she does. Also, she's one of the few wrestlers who actually wrestles week to week, or at least every other week, on weekly television. So I have to respect that. Um, I think the trash match with her and Michin was actually pretty fun. And, uh, you know, she, she's overall, she's improving, right? Not many women in the division can actually say they're improving week to week, or at least attempting to improve month over month. We know Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan are not trying to improve because they don't cut promos and they don't wrestle. So, you know what I'm saying? So I at least respect Chelsea and what she's trying to do. This match was okay. There was a decent bit of counters, um, a bunch of false pinfalls and pin counters. And I think that, you know, some of the moves that Blair Davenport, who's an unmitigated jobber, honestly still kind of thinks she should be fired immediately. But, you know, she she did better tonight than she's ever done in the company so far, so that's a good sign for her. Um, she actually was doing some creative aerial moves. Bianca Belair, we already know she's super athletic. She did like a 450 splash, which was absurd, uh, but after this, though, or during this match, Jade Cargill got absolutely destroyed backstage. Obviously, this was probably the doing of the, the woman's uh, heel side of the woman's War Games match this year, you know, with Nia, Candice, Tiffany, and Liv and Raquel. I'm sure they beat her up backstage and left her there, so it looks like Jade Cargill is being written out of this match at War Games in favor of Bailey being added in as the new fifth member. Why is this happening? I don't know. I don't know if this is to set up a narrative where it's like, oh, it's Bianca's fault that Jade got hurt, so Jade's gonna turn heel and set up Bianca versus Jade. But either way, why are we writing Jade out of this 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 match just to get Bailey in? Right? Nobody really wants to see Bailey at this stage, but it is what it is. At the end of the day, Chelsea Green basically wins this match and beats Blair Davenport, and uh, that's the end of the match. Chelsea Green has advanced, and now she's gonna fight face Bailey next in the U.S. Women's Championship tournament. So that's that. Next, this was absolutely garbage as well um la knight fight santos escobar no one really cares about this match and we all know that santos escobar wasn't going to win so that's not the point the point is here is that shinsuke nakamura is a glorified jobber okay nobody cares about this guy anymore it's the same story thread he did the same thing last year with cody and then we didn't see him for a year because he's boring he's dry he goes out there he basically has a video promo on la night he's like i know you more than you know yourself you want all the fans to cheer for you because you're insecure you're this you're that i'm like okay if he's so insecure then what are you you haven't been on the show in a year so nobody cares about 
about you. At least he's, if he's begging the fans to cheer for him, at least their fans are cheering. They're not cheering for you because they don't care about Shinsuke Nakamura anymore. It's the same stuff. You know, the same thing with Cody last year he did. Your father is inbred, Cody. Your father is inbred. I know more about you than you know about yourself. Like, shut up, dude. It's the same stuff, right? Shinsuke, Shinsuke knows all this stuff, but he's never on TV because he's not good enough to be on TV anymore. So what, what, what do you really know? You know what I'm saying? It's just boring. He's always trying to play this like deeper villain. I have this deeper intent. I know more than you. And then everyone after the feuds with Shinsuke is completely fine after. Seth Rollins was fine. Cody Rhodes won a championship after. LA Knight is going to win, win a championship and retain this US title versus Shinsuke. So this is just boring and it's nonsense. Now anyways, Shinsuke comes out afterwards and knees LA Knight in the back, knocks him down. That's it. Um, then let's get to the next thing. And this is shocking. I just want to say this right now, bro. Cody Rhodes in this segment cut probably the best promo of his entire time since coming back to WWE in 2022. I kid you not. Now, he had that one good promo, which I think he had a good one with uh, Roman when he was like, you will be a, tri a chief without a tribe, you know, all this other stuff. You know what promo I'm talking about if you've seen it. It was a very good promo, but this right here was amazing. It just simply was. The intensity, the emotion, Kevin Owens as well adding to it and being that good. Now, it's a shame that we had to wait, you know, seven months for him to do one good promo on the mic in this championship reign that is has largely been horrendous so far and you know it's still going to probably continue to be awful but the fact that Rome, uh, Randy Orton getting hurt and Kevin Owens you know doing his good side of the promo is what helped bring out this side of Cody Rhodes it, it works all right it, it just works right you know at the end of the day all this is going to do is really just try and at least attempt to set up a, a, a Cody Rhodes and Randy Orton feud after Randy Orton returns and honestly at this point this feud was really good, and it actually had me more excited for this Cody and KO feud than I've been in probably like a solid month at this point, right? Basically, Cody Rhodes talks to KO. KO comes into the crowd, and KO's like, I've been fighting the bloodline and nearly lost my career fighting them week in, week out, getting beat down, all of this stuff, just for the leader of that same bloodline, Cody, for you to team with them at bad blood. That upset me, you know, it threw me off the rocker, yada, 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 and that's why I attacked Randy Orton. Even though I love Randy Orton, he got in my way, and I have to take you down, so this is all your faults and then Cody Rhodes yelling the entire time being super intense making us actually care about what he's talking about for once instead of going like I respect you I love you he actually said something of meaning he basically says that Kevin Owens is just upset because he wants to be the top guy he wants to do all these great things but he doesn't have the courage and basically the balls to get it done right he's accomplished all the things he's a he's you know a, a grand slam champion with the universal title IC tag belts US all that stuff right but even amidst all of that, Cody's like, you still don't, you still don't feel like you're the guy because you're the only one who doesn't recognize that you've accomplished, you know, nothing because it's all been your fault why you haven't accomplished anything. Accomplished anything in recent memory, I should say. Let me just clarify that. <laughs> My bad. This is actually a deeper layer of the promo that Cody got to. And I was like, wow. Like, wow, the way he delivered, he was like, he, Cody also, Cody Rose dropped the bar. He said, you don't hate me, you hate yourself. You're the reason you can't elevate and win all this gold and stuff because you're holding yourself back. And at Bash in Berlin, when, uh, when Cody and KO were fighting, and KO didn't go for Cody's knee and hit him with, you know, the suplex or whatever on the apron and take advantage of it and potentially win the WWE Championship, Cody said that's Kevin Owens' fault. It's not Randy's, it's not mine, it's on you. And this pisses off Kevin Owens, he gets, you know, he gets up closer to Cody Rhodes and he pretty much starts yelling and he's like, look, when I took out Randy Orton, I liked him, but I hate you, Cody Rhodes, I hate you. And from now on, when we do fight, which will be on my terms, which again, we're going to talk about that in a second, why in the world is the WWE Champion bending the knee and letting a jobber like Kevin Kevin Owens decide when the next match is, but again, Cody cannot have a fully amazing promo anytime because he always has to be belittled down to being a lesser than jobber at some point in every segment or match that he's in. It's just a fact. But this was still a very good promo by Cody Rhodes. And basically, they agree on the terms that they will wrestle when Kevin Owens wants them to wrestle for the belt, which again is stupid, right? But anyways, uh, there they agree on those terms and they basically agree that they hate each other and that they will not be pulling back any punches when they eventually fight for the WWE Championship. Leading up to this episode, I have to be consistent. I have said Cody Rhodes' championship reign is the worst. There's one of the worst WWE championship reigns of all time, and it still is. Don't get me wrong. But this promo tonight was genuinely great. We're going to, you know what? We're going to give Cody Rhodes a round of applause. We are, we are going to give him a round of applause, man. Cody Rhodes was phenomenal in this segment. He brought intensity. He brought emotion. He spoke with meaning. He spoke with grit. And he actually made me somewhat invested in this Kevin Owens and Cody Rhodes and Randy Orton, like, you know, trifecta feud situation kind of going on. So 
at the end of the day, <laughs> so believe it or not, I respect you, Cody Rhodes. <laughs> I feel like I just turned face, bro, or something like that, dog. <laughs> I just turned face for Cody Rhodes, man. So there you go. There you have it. Uh, then we get backstage. Cody Rhodes and Carmelo, uh, I almost said Carmelo Anthony. Carmelo Hayes is backstage, and he's basically like, look, Cody, you know what they're saying about you, man? They calling you soft. They saying you're the reason Randy got hurt. But I don't know if they're telling the truth. But the only thing telling the truth is Randy Orton's neck. <laughs> because <laughs> Randy Orton's hurt in the hospital with that neck injury, bruh, and then Cody pushes Mello and says, you need to reevaluate your number one draft pick, Nick Aldis, and this sets up a match next week we're going to get with uh, Cody and Mello, and uh, that's pretty much that. Then we get a Bloodline backstage segment. Roman Reigns, Sammy, Jay, and Jimmy are backstage, and they're basically debating how we're going to run this 4v5, how we're going to move forward, and Roman Reigns basically says, you know what, look, man, this is what we have to do. We have to band together, and Sammy's like, what if I contact, you know, try and talk to Seth Rollins again, or try and talk to Cody Rose, and Roman <laughs> Roman Reigns just lets out a loud, he's like, no, <laughs> just, just that simple, just no, that's old news, and then uh, Roman Reigns basically says, as long as we have us four, as long as we have ourselves, we can win this match, man, we have to go out there and fight, and then everyone's asking, you know, Jay and Sammy and Jimmy are asking, well, what's next then, Oos? And Roman Reigns is like, I don't know. We just have to fight it out. And that's it, you know? And it kind of sets up the, you know, the angst and, you know, the open mark question is of uh, what's about to happen later in the night. You know, who will the fifth member be? Are they really going to run a 4v5? Is Roman going to surrender? All of that stuff. So that was pretty much this segment. And it was kind of funny. And it was kind of, uh, you know, interesting to watch. Then we get, uh, this is where, this is a, arguably the worst part of the night other than Solo's promo. Uh, Bailey and Naomi versus Candice LeRae. Uh, Bailey and Naomi, sorry, versus Candice LeRae and Tiffany Stratton. Um, first off, how many times are we going to see Bailey and Naomi wrestling a tag match versus the collection of either Tiffany, Candice, Tiffany and Nia, Nia and Candice, or two other jobbers from the roster? Like, this is getting boring at this point. The Women's War Games match is going to be one of the worst matches of all time. It just is. There's no story. And I can literally end this because nobody cares who won this match. I don't even remember who won this match. I think it ended in a DQ. And then after it ended, like the, the whole heel side of the Women's War Games, you know, team basically came out and started beating up on everybody. You know, Liv Morgan and Raquel came out and started fighting everyone. And I'm just sitting here. I'm like, why does this nonsense even matter anymore? Right? If Bailey, Naomi, because Bailey, I'm pretty sure, is going to be the new member on the team, right? So if Bailey, Naomi, Bianca, uh, Rhea, and EO Sky end up losing this match, what matters? If Liv Morgan's team ends up losing, what matters? None of it matters. There's no actual outcome that you know has significance going forward. There, the, none of the championships are being defended. So why does any of this stuff even matter in the first place, right? You have to ask yourself these questions. But long story short, after they're teaming up and doing like a four v three on EO, uh, Naomi and Bailey, Rhea Ripley comes out with a kendo stick, right? She gets a massive pop, um, super over, obviously. And uh, she comes over into the ring, and she basically hits Raquel Rodriguez, who stands in front of Liv to take the hit of the kendo stick. And then everyone kind of just runs away because, you know, Rhea Ripley is basically just Superman at this point. Anytime Rhea Ripley shows up in the ring and there's multiple people in it, she's just going to 1v4 whoever's in the ring. It's that simple. Triple H books her to the point where she's just egregiously overpowered, and it makes no sense. How is someone who's wrestled two television matches in all of 2024 being booked as if they wrestle each week and win every match? It makes no sense when you think about it, right? Just think about that for a second. You wrestle two matches an entire year, yet you get the right to show up each week in 1v4 everyone. What's the point of the 5v5 at War Games? If Rhea Ripley can take out four or five of them by herself, what is the point? What's the point of the match? She doesn't need other four members to help her out if she can 1v4 them with a kendo stick in her hand. It's just ridiculous at this point. So I don't really care about the women's war game stuff. The story is stale. It has no meaningfulness going forward. Meaningfulness is probably not even a word. But again, you know, th this promo shouldn't have even been a thing. Or this segment shouldn't have even been a thing. So that's pretty much that. Uh, Bianca went off in an ambulance with Jade Cargill earlier tonight. So I don't know what's happening with that. But like I said, I think Jade's going to be written out of this match so that Bailey can enter. And at this point... I don't know what the thought process on thought process is on this. I'm assuming it's to set up, you know, Jaden Bianca going forward as, you know, uh, fighting against each other maybe, but it's just dumb. It, it really is, man. This match carries no weight. This feud is literally paper thin story wise. It makes no sense, and the actual outcome of the match means nothing going forward. So, you know, whatever. This this was stupid. Uh, then we had Tommaso Ciampa versus Montez Ford. This was actually a solid match for what it was. I think it lasted like uh maybe like uh what like 
10 minutes maybe, but it was pretty good for the 10 minutes. Montez Ford was doing that little like Superman dive thing he does over the rope. Uh, Tommaso hit a phenomenal knee counter uh, to Montez Ford doing like a springboard dropkick kind of move, so that was an awesome moment. This match for a 10-minute match was honestly pretty good, quite frankly. I mean, when you factor in that they were only given like, you know, a 10-minute a match with like one commercial in between, they did a good job here. There was good counters, there was good selling, there was athleticism, there was energy. Uh, Montez Ford is amazing at pretty much everything at this point, at least in my opinion. Opinion. And uh, Tommaso Champ is actually kind of growing on me, right? He's a decent heel. The only problem is that DIY gets absolutely no reaction from the crowd. During this match, there's multiple points where they're literally chanting Street Profits. They're chanting Montez, Montez, or Profits, Profits, whatever they were saying. Montez Ford and the Profits are obviously over. They're a lot more over than the Motor City Machine bums. You know, raise your fists. And they're obviously way more over than DIY, who gets no reaction when they come out. Even with Tommaso doing decent heel work, no one cares about DIY. After this match, um, you know, Tommaso pretty much is upset because Montez Ford won off of a uh, off of a roll up. So Dawkins comes out and has to help him because Johnny Gargano comes out to you know push Tommaso back after he tries to attack Montez. Once Montez wins, and the Motor City Machine Guns come out and try and hold Tommaso back. Tommaso pushes down Johnny Gargano and then walks away and says, "What team are you on, Johnny? Come on, man, you're supposed to support me." Again. I think Tommaso's doing an okay job as a heel so far, but realistically speaking, if the titles don't end up on, on Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins, nobody cares about this stuff. Let's just be honest, right? Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins have more talent in their pinkies than DIY and Motor City Machine Bums do combined. It's very simple. They're bigger, more athletic, and more charismatic versions of both of those tag teams, DIY and Motor City Machine Guns. It's not close. So at this point, we're just holding out hope for Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins to win the tag belts or for Montez Ford to go on a singles run and, you know, win a singles goal at some point. But that's that. Then we get to the main event. This main event segment was incredible. I kid you not. It was absolutely phenomenal, okay? It starts out with Sol Sokoa basically saying how he still loves, you know, Roman. He loves Jay. He loves Sammy. And he loves Jimmy, right? But at the end of the day, he has to be honest. It's a 5v4. And if they don't acknowledge him, he's going to have to hurt them. And then as Roman Reigns is handed the mic from Solo and is tries about to lift his hand to say something on the mic, we hear the return of Paul Heyman, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Hey, man, and he gets a massive pop from the crowd when he says, ladies and gentlemen, dude, it was absolutely beautiful. It was awesome. He was sporting the red and black colors, dude. It was absolutely epic, but this is not even the best part because the wise man basically gets on the mic. You know, everyone's hype, hyped and happy to see this guy back. Paul Heyman basically says, excuse me if I'm wrong, you know, I got powerbombed through a table in Madison Square Garden. However, we can't have a 5v4 for war games, so that means we need a fifth member. And the fifth member is... And CM Punk comes out, and CM Punk just comes out ready to go, man. He's taping up his hands. He's ready to brawl. He gets in the ring, and it is a 5v5 brawl with the new bloodline versus the OG bloodline plus CM Punk, dog. This was absolutely awesome awesome. You could tell when this was happening that this was an absolute and utter moment. You were witnessing something special. It's amazing. As much as I have bashed CM Punk for his recent run in WWE, I've always been consistent with this. Punk still cuts good promos, and he still is a wrestling star. He is a draw, right? He is a draw like, you know, uh, you know. obviously you have certain people who are draws in today's day and age. We know this, right? Roman Reigns, you know, your Randy Orton's a rock. You know, obviously the Rock and Cena are on a different level of drawing ability, but you get the point. Rock, Roman, Cena, Punk, all these guys, right? So seeing a guy who I grew up with who was actually in his prime back in the day who was wrestling great matches and you know wasn't getting out of breath in 10 seconds like he does now but uh you know punk was wrestling great matches doing amazing work punk is going to go down as an all-time great believe it or not right i know most people agree with it but you know some people don't think he is but i think punk is an all-time great and he's going to go down as one and to see him in the ring with roman reigns who is also going to go down as an all-time great is just an epic moment along with the bloodline context and everything and the wise man coming back and introducing punk who's also returning after a couple months this was sick. It was epic. And to see them all brawling, and then uh, at the end, you know, Sami Zayn and Jay and Jimmy were hitting, like, the over-the-rope dives and everything like that. It was sick. And then CM Punk and Roman have a little bit of a stare-down moment. And then Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa get in there. And then this is the best part, of, in my opinion. This was one of the best parts. CM Punk hits a GTS at the same time that Roman Reigns hits a spear on Tonga Loa. So they, like, time it up perfectly so the finishers hit at the exact same moment. It was Amazing. It was just awesome to see this stuff at this point. To see these two interact 
was great. It just was, right? The little kid in me was just marking out at this point. It was amazing, right? It was absolutely sick. And then they stare down again afterwards, and they're kind of just looking at each other, and Roman Reigns mouths to Punk. He's like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And Punk mouths back. He's like, it's not about you and me. It's about him. And he points to the wise man. So, you know, Roman basically knows Punk's on his side, and they're going to do this for the wise man and do it for the bloodline. So, you know what, man? At this point, the Bloodline story has transcended wrestling, right? Even though Cody cut a great promo tonight, uh, the simple fact is, is that the Bloodline has overshadowed every championship in the WWE. The, the WWE championship and the world title, US title, IC title mean absolutely nothing in comparison to the Bloodline story. It's a very simple premise at this point, right? Um, the Bloodline story has transcended everything, especially because we don't even have The Rock back yet. And we don't even have The Rock and Cody and Rock Roman. Like, it's going to get even crazier than it is right now. This story has just transcended everything. The, the layers to it, the context, the long-term booking, which, again, you know, like I said in my video a couple days comparing Vince and Triple H as bookers, Triple H, the only good thing he does is the long-term booking that builds up to the four PLEs, the four big ones, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Mania, and Royal Rumble. That is literally the best thing that Triple H does, and he's proving it tonight. This quick build-up to Survivor Series has gotten more awesome because of the build-up of Punk and uh, and Heyman interacting months ago back in like the summer, right? And then uh, after this happens, you know, it sets up uh, Heyman teaming with Punk one more time, you know, to set up this Bloodline, OG Bloodline uh, versus New Bloodline match at Survivor Series War Games. So Punk and Roman stare down, and then as the camera fades to black, they're about to raise their ones up, but I have this picture here. Um, apparently, they raised their ones up and Punk to the go to sleep, you know, uh, kind of like symbolism um, after the show ran, went off the air. So that's pretty much that. Next week's episode is taped, so we'll see the segment that is likely going to happen between Roman, Wiseman, and CM Punk. So I'm really looking forward to that, dude. Um, but yeah, this was an awesome ending. The crowd was chanting, this is awesome for a reason. It was a moment. It was special. Both returns of Wiseman and uh, or Paul Heyman, I should say. I don't know why I'm calling him Wiseman, but you get the point, right? The Wiseman, Paul Heyman, and uh, CM Punk coming back. Both got great pops um, to see all of them in the ring. And, you know, Heyman smiling. This shot right here where Heyman is sitting back and smiling at two greats in the ring with Punk and Roman is just, it's awesome shot. It's a great moment, right? As much as I bash these shows... I have to be objective and honest when they're actually great. And tonight's episode was genuinely great. It wasn't perfect, obviously, because of the women's related stuff and the Shinsuke stuff. But man, this was an awesome ending and one of the best endings to a WWE TV show Raw Smackdown in the history of WWE. It just was, especially in the recent history, like the last five years or whatnot, right? Um, and, the, you know, a couple more things we need to discuss about this, too. Uh, CM Punk being on side of this War Games team, there is a problem. Now, the problem is, first off, I did think that Brock Lesnar was going to come back. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I genuinely thought that Brock Lesnar was going to show up tonight. Because when Paul Heyman looked at the, you know, he, he pointed to the stage, and I was thinking, wait a minute, the fifth member for the new bloodline is Brunson Reed. You need a beast to take down another beast. So, boom. I thought Brock was coming out. But, you know, Brock didn't come out. But it's okay. You know, Punk Punk will fill in in a sense of, you know, the star power role, I guess, right? He doesn't have the same star power as Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns. But, you know, he serves his purpose and, you know, it worked for the story. But at the end of the day, CM Punk is not the same condition in way he used to be in the ring. In all of the matches he had with Drew McIntyre, he was pretty much carried through all of the matches, right? I mean, Drew McIntyre did a majority of the moves. Even in the Hell in a Cell match, he did a majority of the moves. And uh, I feel like Punk gets out of breath easier now. He's a bit slower. But again, it's a 5v5 in war game, so we'll be able to mask some of those issues up, I suppose. But I don't know how this is going to match up. You got Brunson Reed and Fatu who are booked as monsters and enforcers. The bloodline, the OG bloodline has no real enforcers, right? And the most diverse movesets out of the team as, uh, in terms of the current condition of these wrestlers are Sami Zayn and Roman Reigns. Those are the best in-ring wrestlers on the team of the OG bloodline at this point because they have diverse movesets they can sell. And, you know, they have in-ring storytelling mechanics as well. They're really good with that stuff. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, obviously Jay and Jimmy and Punk to an extent. But, you know, obviously Roman Reigns is on a different level in that aspect. And Sami Zayn is just, I mean, in the ring, he's, he's just better than Jimmy and Jay, all right? It's just a fact at this point. He's also better than the current version version of punk um so it's gonna be interesting to see how the both of these sides interact and it will be interesting to see seth rollins's heel turn because i'm gonna tell you this right now the fact that he told jimmy jay and sammy that he would never team with roman again but he would team with them if he had to and then they go and team with roman and then roman goes and teams with his arch nemesis cm punk and cm punk teams with, with rollins's other arch nemesis roman reigns it's going to be a very interesting and diabolical dynamic when seth rollins loses his mind in the coming weeks or months on raw this dude is going to go heel and it looks like he's going to be the heel in the seth and punk feud that's likely going to happen for mania 41 so this set up a bunch of different things. 
Um, it tied back some of the booking to, you know, Punk and Heyman back in the summer and them talking to the new bloodline. And then it also ties in Roman and Punk being on the same team, the wise men coming back, OG bloodline with the honorary U Sami Zayn and the new honorary U CM Punk, I should say, you know what I'm saying? But um, it's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. I think the bloodline match should have been a 4v4 for sure. And I've been consistent on that. I still do think it should have been a 4v4, even with Punk being involved. But, uh, you know, if they're not going to go in that route and they're going to do this, Let's just hope they execute it. From a story perspective, segment perspective, and promo perspective, this should realistically work. I'll see what the in-ring week, the in-ring work looks like next week. But uh, yeah, I had fun with this episode. It was pretty good from top to bottom. It was shockingly good, I should say. And Cody Rhodes being able to cut a promo, uh, Chelsea Green being over with the crowd, and CM Punk joining this Bloodline team are the three main surprises of the night and arguably three of the biggest surprises of the year. I'm genuinely shocked right now that Cody cut a good promo like that. I'm shocked. Well, I'm not super shocked Punk is on the new Bloodline team, their OG Bloodline team. And, you know, Chelsea Green being over, it, it is what it is, right? You know, it happens to the best of us. She earned it, and, uh, you know, she's got her way. So that's it. This episode of SmackDown, I'm giving it a solid 8.5 out of 10. The only reason it's not getting higher than that is obviously because of the woman stuff, um, the Shinsuke stuff, and uh, that's pretty much it. Those two things were absolutely horrendous and made me have to, you know, drop down this show a couple episodes. But everything else outside of those two aspects was absolutely phenomenal tonight. It just was. Amazing episode overall, and uh, we'll just see what happens next week because we're likely on a downward spiral from here, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, you can have one great episode, but it ain't going to happen back-to-back -back weeks, or is it? You know, we'll see what happens. But let me know what you thought about this episode. Let me know what you think about Roman and Punk and the Bloodline. And let me know what you think will happen at Survivor Series War Games going forward. As always, I hope you guys have a phenomenal day. Peace out. One love.